The story of the Roswell Mill women, little known outside of Georgia, took place between the Battle of Kennesaw Mountain and the battles for Atlanta. The Army of Confederate General Joseph Johnson had fallen back across the Chattahoochee River, and Sherman was looking for a way to get his army across. He sent the cavalry division of General Garrard sweeping eastward back upstream with orders to capture Roswell, which sits on the river's northern bank and was lightly defended by home guardsmen and a few rebel horsemen. Despite its tiny size, the town, which until the war was known primarily as an upland escape for the aristocracy's elite from coastal Georgia's brutal summers, had become the center of a thriving textile industry during the war. The cotton mill was cranking up to about 191,000 yards of cloth per month and the woolen mill up to 30,000 yards of Roswell gray uniforms. Each of the mills employed hundreds of women, some of them black. After easily capturing the town, Gerard turned his attention to the town's woolen mill and cotton mill. He was startled to find a French flag flying atop the woolen mill in what turned out to be a ploy by its Confederate owner to keep it from being destroyed. The ploy failed. Gerard, noting no U.S. flag atop the French one, ordered both mills burned to the protest of a French mill hand who had been granted temporary ownership of the factor by its Confederate owner a day or two earlier. Apprised of the situation, Sherman wrote Garrard that, should you, under any impulse of anger, hang the wretch, I approve the act beforehand. The mill hand, a Frenchman named Theophile Rocher, survived. Sherman then ordered Garrard to arrest all employees of the factory and let them foot it under guard, the ten miles or so to Marietta from where he said he would have them sent north via boxcar to Indiana. Added Sherman, the poor woman will make a howl, let them take along their children and clothing. To General Henry Halleck in Washington, Sherman noted that the women were tainted with treason and are as much governed by the rules of war as if in the ranks. The whole region was devoted to manufactories, but I will destroy every one of them. He added the next day, whenever the people are in the way, ship them to a new country north and west. Within days, Gerard had transported as many as 700 people nearly all of them women and children, by wagon to Marietta. Their arrival there made the front pages of the New York newspapers. By July 15th, two whole trainloads of the refugees had been given nine days' rations and sent north. The ultimate fate of the Roswell women has been a matter of great local conjecture ever since. Many did not survive the trip, and those that arrived in the northern state were never able to return to their homes. Adeline Bagley Boos's husband was in the rebel army. Though pregnant, she was sent to Chicago and was unable to return to Georgia with her daughter for five years. By that time, her husband, who thought her dead, had remarried. Employing children, another young girl worked as a mill worker. Her mother and grandmother also worked in the Roswell Mill and all three were deported. The girl's mother died aboard a train in Tennessee and her death was followed shortly by that of her grandmother, while the group was being transported via steamship up the Ohio River. The old woman had been so feeble that she was carried on board the boat in a rocking chair. The young girl, now alone, was stranded far from home, grieving the loss of her mother and grandmother. She was never to return to her Georgia home.